Hi guys, welcome back. It's Miss Valdez. Um, how are you guys doing this weekend? Okay, so today we're going to go over observational learning. I know you guys are finishing up on the learning chapter in AP Psych. Excuse me. And um, observational learning is actually towards the end because the more simpler of the three basic ones that they teach you about in the book. Um, so we're going to go over it today and review it. And then we'll go back over and review the other two as well, classical and operant conditioning. And hopefully this will help you out and prepare you for your tests for whatever um, teacher you have um, and how your teacher teaches or exams or an alternative assessment. Um, some really quick things. You have the at Think Fiveable social medias. You have us on Twitter. You have us on Instagram. And you can also follow us on YouTube. We have a YouTube page. Um, I would be wearing my shirt, but I'm not today because I went to, I just got home from my my nephew's a hockey game and it was kind of cool to see him. He was actually in the, um, I actually got a really good picture of him in the penalty box, which was kind of funny. Cause I remember when he was tiny and now he's getting older and, and, and it's funny watching him play now. Cause he's like more serious. Um, Here's some information about me. I'm an AP, uh, I'm an AP psychology content streamer for Fiveable. I have taught, taught AP psychology for the last 14 years at the school. And the school I teach is in Riverside County, County in Southern California. Um, that's the picture of um, our latest trip to Halloween Horror Nights because Halloween just ended. We're getting ready for Thanksgiving. Um, one of my favorite holidays of the year is Halloween, followed by Christmas. Well, when Christmas is, we're about less than a month away from that. Um, and so let's get ready and let's talk about some observational learning. Um, so we're going to talk about, like I said, it's a review of the foundations of psychology of learning. One part of it is observational learning, um, which leads, which wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for classical conditioning. So I always connect every content to that main thing. Um, the person, whenever you hear the word observational learning, you should know the name Albert Bandura. Like, so if I say classical conditioning, you should know Pavlov. And if I say operant conditioning, you should know, does anybody know the name of the person for that's related to operant condition? He had that famous box. Can anybody answer for me? Nope. Yep. Are y'all still sleeping and recovering from your weekend? It's Skinner, if you don't remember his name. Um, we're going to talk about the actual neurons in your brain that actually grow from observational learning. We're going to talk about the main experiment. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that big blow-up doll. It's like a bobo, the clown blow-up doll, you know, the kind that you can punch, and then they come back at you. That's the famous Albert Bandura bobo the clown experiment that demonstrated observational learning. We're going to go over that. We're going to talk about the results of that experiment. And we're going to also talk about positive and negative modeling and how we learn by observation from others around us and how even how the media, it used to be that I would talk about how TV and movies, but now we have all types of media. Pardon me. I just got through eating lunch, so I, I apologize. Um, that influence the things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we wear. So let's go into it and talk about some observational learning. Um, so here's some basic facts about observational learning. Among higher animals and human learning does not need to occur through direct experience. So what they mean by that is like, let me think, do any of you have little brothers or sisters at home? Do any of you live with have toddlers in your house or been around toddlers? Anybody? Y'all still sleeping or what? Or no one has a toddler that they live with? All right. Well, toddlers tend to mimic things that they see. Um, for example, have you ever seen a baby pick up a remote control, you know, a TV remote, and they put it up to their head like this, as if they're talking into a cell phone? Why do they do that? What do they see adults do all day long? Grab, grab that little thing that looks like a remote control and put it up to their head. They're mimicking what they see. That whole idea of monkey see, monkey do. That's where observational learning comes from. 
Um, learning by observation and imitating others. I mean, I want you to think really hard. Have you ever found yourself um, mimicking something your parents or the people around you do all the time? Like having the same phrase as the same person you hang around with all the time or like um, mimicking um, something like your mom or dad have said or done. Cause that's, they're, they're the best role models that we see every day. So we find ourselves repeating actions that we see constantly in front of us. Um, going all the way back then, this is how this relates to behaviorism. Um, we, we, we are a product of what we learn because of what we learn by observation. I mean, nobody told us that putting the middle finger up was inappropriate. We learned that by seeing, okay? That's not an okay thing to do. Don't do that, that's uh, inappropriate. Um, but you see little kids who imitate, they see an adult do it and then they do it. And it's like, dude, you can't let a little kid do that. And then we laugh and we think it's funny. And now we go from observational learning to operant because now you're laughing and you're showing the kid, the little kid that that's okay. And then it's funny and then he'll get a laugh. So he'll repeat the uh, behavior again. So modeling is really important, whether it be positive or negative modeling. Um, social, social norms are learned this way. And what I mean by that is if you see the corner over here, this is actually a picture right here from the bubble the count experiment. There's the blow up doll right here. Okay. And we talk about memes and human beings are actually very much. And most people, when I say a meme, people think social memes and, um, what it is is that we're pretty much supreme mean machines. I mean, we're very social creatures and animals. And it's like this, um, fashion when it comes to teenagers. Most teenagers don't dress like their parents. I mean, unless you have a hip or cool parent that dresses like Beyonce or, or Jay-Z, you're not gonna go wearing your clothes that your mom and dad wear every day unless they're kind of hip like that because teenagers have their own sense of style. They have their own fashion based on what they see others wear. Foods, the foods we eat, we see, we eat certain foods based on the fact that we see other people, well, that's good. So let me let me try it and see and repeat it and see if I like it too. Um, traditions that we pass from one generation to the next, from family to next. This is all based on observational learning. And these, so these memes that we create from one, from one culture to the next, from one generation to the next is because we're learning by seeing, by seeing other people do these things. Oh, that looks good on them. I might try that, like that outfit that you see on somebody and you're like, dude, that would look so much better on me. And then you wear it and it compliments you because you saw someone doing it first and then you went to go do it yourself. Um, the easiest way to explain observational learning um, is, and I always like to use this with my students, um, can it, does it, did any of you ever watch the Power, Power, Power Rangers when you were younger or the Ninja Turtles or Superman or DC Comics or anything like that? I'll wait till someone answers me. Anybody? Come on. There's only three of you in here, so one of you got to answer me. Are you telling me none of you ever tried to leap off a tall building and jump off your bed and fly like Superman? But why do little kids do that? Because they see others doing that. They see it on the cartoon, so they try to pretend. You never try to climb the wall like Spider-Man? You get my meaning? Monkey see, monkey do. Um, I think I always like to use the Power Rangers because most of my students had Power Rangers. And I said, did you ever go out and like one Power Ranger versus the other and, you know, play fight or be a super ninja turtle and go out there or even, hey, Kim Possible, which I always think from one generation to the next, cartoons change, but I mean, pretty much the same thing with kids. They see something and then they try to do it themselves. Monkey see, monkey do. And that's pretty much what observational learning is. So um, how did we prove that this was even a theory? Albert Bandura came up with this idea. And I'm actually going to post the YouTube link because I can't really show it on um, my PowerPoint. But I'm going to break down the experiment for you. And I'll post the YouTube link um, 
if any of you want to come back on Bible later and you can actually see the video, it's up on YouTube. You just got to type in Albert, Albert Bandura, um, you, um, pardon me, Bobo the Clown Experiment, and it'll come up. And it's pretty funny to watch. My kids laugh all the time every time I show it because, you know, because I kind of narrate it and make it fun. It's an old video from the 70s, so just be prepared. It's like the picture with the fuzziness right here. You're going to see all that. So let me go to the next slide. Hold on. All right. So before we do that, we're going to talk about mirror neurons. Okay. So every time we learn something from observational learning, there's actually a neuron in our brain called specifically mirror neurons. Neuroscientists have discovered an area of the brain that provides a neural basis for observational learning. And it's these mirror neurons that store that information. We got this, we were able to confirm this through the monkey experiments because we study animals as you learn in science to learn about human beings. Um, PET, PET scans reveal the same thing about humans. Language is also served in the area, empathy. So these neurons help children learn by observation how to mind lip, tongue movements when forming. I mean, think about it. When you're teaching a baby how to talk and you're going like, mama, dad, dad, they're looking at your lips. They're looking at the placement of your teeth. They're looking at tongue so that they can learn how to form the words. I mean, you are virtually showing them how to pronounce and speak. And most of you haven't gotten that far, this far yet, depending on your teacher. But in um, the cognition chapter, they go over um, language, right? And this is what I mean by, and I always bring this up when I teach this anyway, even though it's kind of like a little bit off the topic. But when you're teaching babies how to talk, most people trip out that babies say dad, dad before mama, right? And I'm trying, and I try to, and I tell the kids, I'm going to teach you something I learned in my linguistics class that's part of the language. And then they talk about Noam Chomsky when you go to guys go to cognition. Um, and you're mimicking a baby and showing a baby how to go mama. You see how my mouth, my lips curl around my teeth. Now, try to make the M sound right now without using your teeth or your lips. Try to make it. Try to make the D sound, the D, like dog, without touching the tip of your mouth with your tongue. Try to make the S sound without putting your teeth together. See, these are all things that, we're, and it's weird, right? Because you're like, what? I mean, technically speaking, the only sound you can really make probably without using your teeth and your lips and your tongue is the the H sound. But even then you curl your tongue inside your mouth. But all of this is something that you teach babies. So watch this. Why do babies say dad, dad before mama? What don't babies have the first six months of life? At least they don't start growing them until about four or six months. When you make the M sound, mama, your lips curl around your teeth. Do babies have a lot of teeth to make mama? But watch this. How easy, how easy is it to say dad, da? Do you need teeth for dad, da? And that's what I mean about um, visually teaching and you're learning and you're showing and babies imitate the sound based on watching the adult's lips. And that creates the first mirror neurons in their brain. It's kind of funny and trippy when you think about it. Um, but that's why they say dad, dad before mama nine times out of 10, even though the dads get all hyped up, but I hate to burst your butt bubble. You know, you might want to teach your, teach people that, but that's the only reason why that happens. So let's go to Bobo the Clown Experiment, make life easier for us, shall we? All right. So this is some pictures of the Bobo the Clown Experiment. Okay. So what Albert Bandura did is he conducts an experiment on campus. And I'm going to just talk about the experiment, but if you look at the PowerPoint, it, um, it breaks down it by parts. So I'm just going to explain what happens. So he gets two kids, right? And these are his um, 
experimental group. This isn't his control group. This is an experimental group. This is a review. I'm using the key, key terms from the science chapter for a reason. Does everybody here know what the experiment, what's the difference between the control group and the experimental group? Can anybody tell me? Hmm? Someone ready to answer a question? Or are you guys still half asleep? What's the difference between the control group and the experimental group in an experiment? Who gets the sugar pill? Is it the experimental group or the control group? Can anybody tell me? Come on, guys. You guys got it. I mean, I know it's a Sunday. Trust me. I'm feeling it's a Sunday. But school's back to session tomorrow. Got to wake up that brain. Got to turn those neurons on. Well, I mean, the simplest way to put it is the experimental group is the group that gets the independent variable. They're the ones that get messed with. So Albert Bandura gets these two little kids and he takes them into a room that has that two-way mirror. And on the other side of the room, right, through the window, they see an adult enter this room. And the room is like a children's playground. It's got every toy imaginable. It's got a tetherball in the corner. It's got a kitchen. It's got a play kitchen. It's got anything a kid would want to play with. It's like a playroom full of toys. It's like somebody got dropped off at Toys R Us. All right. So the two little kids, both the boy and girl, are watching through the rearview mirror, right? And he brings them in at one at a time. He doesn't bring them in together. And he has them watch the adult who you see at the top right here go into the room, okay? The adult goes into the room and she starts looking at Bobo and head straight for the Bobo, the, the doll, the blow-up clown. And she just starts kicking the crap out of Bobo. She starts hitting Bobo. She jumps on top of the Bobo clown, starts mashing him in the face. She even starts cursing and using foul language at Bobo. She does that for a good, I think, four or five minutes while the kids are watching, each independently of each other, and then she leaves the room. Then Bandura goes, hey, Kitty, would you like to go in the room and go play with all the toys? And the kids go, yeah, let me go in, let me go in. So he lets each of the kids go in one at a time. And there's all these toys. There's a tetherball. There's all, that's like a child's playground, right? What do you think the kids head to first? Do they head to the treasure chest of toys? Do they play with the tetherball in the corner? Do they play with any of the balls? Can anybody tell me where you think the, 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 the kids head to first? I'll give you three guesses, or should I do a poll? I'm going to do a poll. Let's see. Ask a question. Hey. Okay, a poll. Fine. Create a poll. What do the kids play with first? Is it... Tetherball? Toy chess? Or Bo, Bo the Clown? All right. So I have my poll going, and we'll see what everybody decides to put. But hopefully, you guys all put what I think you did. The kid, each the boy and the girl, instead of going to any of the toys and just playing with them, they head straight smack for Bobo. They go to Bobo. The boy himself starts kicking the crap out of Bobo. He starts beating Bobo up. He gets a toy gun out of the toy chest, points it at Bobo the clown's head. He starts telling Bobo stuff, starts cursing at Bobo. Sound familiar? Just like what he saw the adult do. And he just keeps beating Bobo up. Okay. So that's what the little boy does. So then they move on to the little girl who witnessed the same adult going in the room. Question. Do you think the boy or the girl are going to be more violent when it comes to Bobo? If the little boy went straight for Bobo, what do you think the little girl's going to do? Is she going to go straight for the doll set? The playhouse? She Is she going to go cook in the play kitchen? Or is she going to go straight for Bobo? And if she goes straight for Bobo, is she going to be more violent than the boy? What do you think? Who thinks girls are more violent than boys? Anybody? Who thinks girls are more aggressive than boys? 
honestly, boys are taught to be aggressive. So it's it's in their to DNA to be more aggressive than boys. But what do you guys think? Do you think girls can be just as aggressive as boys? I mean, you guys go to school. You've seen what the kind of fights girls get into and boys get into. Who gets, you know? Well, let me put it this way. If you if and when you watch the video, the girl actually gets a little bit more creative with the way she beats up Bobo. I think if I remember correctly, first she walks over to Bobo. She starts hitting Bobo. In one of the pictures right here, she grabs Bobo and throws him up in the air. Okay, hold on, I gotta go back. Slide. Okay, she grabs Bobo and throws him up in the air. Then she walks over to, I'll never forget this. She walks over to the stove, the play stove for the play kitchen and grabs the pan, which is supposed to be there to cook something with, right? What does she use the pan to pretend cook? No, she grabs the pan, walks over and starts beating the crap out of Bobo with it. And then she gets, <laughs> then she gets one of the dolls that's in the toy chest and she gets the doll. You think, does she start playing with the doll? No, she grabs the doll by the leg and starts beating Bobo up with the doll. Um, and then the best part of the video, I think, which is why I say watch the video because it's really interesting to watch. Um, she um, takes Bobo and moves him next to where the tether ball, and there's literally in this room, there is a pole with a tether ball tied to it. Most of, uh, most of you know what tether ball is, yes? Yes? I'm going to assume you do. And she takes the ball and throws it so that it bumps and hits Bobo's head. And when it's not working at the same time, she moves Bobo so that the ball can hit Bobo's head. I mean, she is so much more creative than the boy. It is hilarious to watch. Um, so all this happened with these kids. I mean, these kids are in a playroom that has like, it's like going to Toys R Us and every toy there is possible, yet they go straight for the blow up doll and start kicking the out of the bow up doll because the pet they saw the adult do it all because they monkey see monkey do that is basically observational learning so and like i said because some of the kids were using the language that they heard the adult use even the verbal cues they repeated it so van der concluded that the reasons why we model others behavior is because the reinforcements and punishments we receive so when they saw the adult go in the room and the adult didn't get in trouble and they were just looking and no one was mad at what the adult was doing, they each went into that room and did the same thing. But I mean, the whole room was full of toys, but they go to the blow up doll and start beating the crap out of it. So Albert Bandura's experiment just proved that we are a monkey see monkey do society. Um, I've had some fun with this <laughs> when um, I taught my um, the science chapter of um, this in my class. I, I would tell the students, I have the students go do social experiments outside the room. And I used to tell them, well, go out in the middle of the quad, right? They're like, yeah, have some fun. They're like, what do you mean have some fun? I go out in the middle quad and talk three or four of your friends to go out in the middle at lunchtime and just look up and just look like you're staring at something and count and see how many people will join you just because three or four of you are looking up at the sky. And you would be amazed how many people just stop and go, what the heck are they looking at, you know? And you're not looking at nothing, you're just doing something, but because someone sees you do it, they do it too. It makes no sense, but that's the society we live in. Monkey see, monkey do society. And that's how easy observational learning is. It literally is just repeating an action we've seen. Have any of you ever, um, like, like I said, mimicked one of your family members, um, done something your mom or dad have done, found yourself saying something your mom or dad have done, and it's because we saw them doing it, so we did it too. I'm gonna go on to the, so does anybody have any questions about the Bubble the Clown experiment? It is something that, tends to appear on the AP exam. Um, like classical conditioning has Ivan Pavlov. Operant conditioning has Skinner. You need to know that Albert Bandura is observational learning. Okay. Hold on a second, just a second. 
Babe, lower, please. Sorry, my husband's talking on the phone. He was being a little loud. All right. So, as far as Bandura's conclusions, um, basically, we look, we learn. We see, we learn. We repeat what we see. I mean, really, really think about it. Have you ever caught yourself wearing something because you saw someone else wearing it? Have you ever gone and done something because you saw someone else doing it? Have you ate something because, oh, dang, that looks good. I'm going to eat it too. I mean, we are literally, we look, we learn. By looking, we learn to anticipate a behavior or consequence in a given situation like those we are observing. So if it looks like it's going to be good, we do it. You know what I mean? If it looks like, and that's where we get reinforcements coming in and it moves from observational learning to operant conditioning. And this is what I mean by foundations of, um, of learning because everything connects back to the original. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about media and how people see stuff and automatically just assume that it's okay. And I used to, I used to have this labeled as television, but now media is so much more. We have social media, we have YouTube, we have the web, we have, um, video games. I mean, it's a multitude of things, but people see things like you see physical intimidation on TV, bullying. You see sexual behavior on TV. Um, people think that because teenager, and let me tell you something, when I was a teenager, they used to say all teenagers were having to, and that is not true. Okay. It is not, and it's still not either, but all they do is throw all this stuff out at us and, and we are social animals. We do learn by observation. So we assume and think things because we see it. And I'll give you a case in point. Do any of you recognize the cartoon right there? Does anybody know the name of the cartoon picture I have in this slide right here? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Wait, need to find out. Anybody, come on. None of you know this cartoon right here? Huh? I'm waiting to see if anybody knows. You guys are really asleep this week, and I thought I was bad because I'm really, really tired myself, but I've just had a long week, and it's going to be another week because we made it to the semifinals for football, and it was a really good game, and we came from behind, and we were losing 20 to nothing at the second half, and then we ended up winning 28 to nothing, 28 to 20. So it was really cool, not nothing. But okay, so going back to what we're teaching about. That, my dears, is a cartoon called South Park. Have any of you heard of South Park? Okay. There was this one episode. It was called <laughs> Beat a Ginger Day. And, and I always use this in class because I always I think it's funny, but it happened, so I'm going to do it. Um, in the cartoon... South Park, which is not appropriate for anybody to be watching under the age. I don't think anybody should be watching that cartoon unless you're like a high school age or older. But people let their kids watch whatever the heck they want. I'm not going to say nothing, but this is an example why you don't let your kids watch everything. Um, they have an episode called Beat a Ginger in which the boys in the, sh in the episode, they beat up on a redheaded kid because he's redheaded. No reason, just because he's redheaded. So... <laughs> Some kids, and this was on the news, some kids at an actual elementary school in the middle of the United States went to school and they beat up on all the redheaded kids at school. They literally beat up on all the redheaded kids at school. And when the principal asked them why, be a ginger day. Because they saw something on TV, they did it. And that's what I mean by media and media influence. People are like, well, then why do we have social influencers? If, well, I know people are like, but Miss Valdez, you know, just because people see stuff doesn't mean they do it. I hear what you're saying, but I can tell you tons of times. I mean, and this happens every year. Somebody saw something and then they do it. No, you know, not everybody has a mom and dad that teaches them what you see on TV isn't real. Not everybody has that. I mean, let me put it this way. Okay, 
I all three of my my daughters went to high school, and you know they all have a PlayStation, and they were cheerleaders. So I bought them, and they really like playing PlayStation, right? So I bought them that game. It was where it, the the cheerleader had a chainsaw, and she was killing zombies left and right. And you know, and we're and I'm really much a horror fleek, so we so we go to horror nights and. We do we watch a bunch of scary movies. But my kids don't go to school the next day and then start taking a chainsaw on, you know, everybody up. But not everybody is lucky to have stuff like that at home. Um, my generation grew up with, um, you guys, are you familiar with Boomerang? The, car, the, the, cable, the cable station Boomerang. Okay. When I was younger and I used to watch Looney Tunes, which are like my favorite cartoons ever, and um, Tom and Jerry. Are you familiar with those cartoons? Have you noticed anything about those cartoons that are different from the ones you guys brought were brought up with? Anything a little bit different? I mean, hello. If you watch them, they were pretty, pretty violent. And they were dropping like bombs, shooting guns, I'm blowing up. The Roadrunner was trying to always blow up. Um, the Coyote was always trying to blow up the Roadrunner. I mean, they had a lot of violence in them. And then um, as kids, so they decided when you guys were born and the generation before you, that they were going to strip all those cartoons of all that violence, which is why if you want to see those old cartoons, you have to watch them on Boomerang and not on normal TV because they don't have them there anymore. Even though I consider them classics, they still were pretty violent when you go back and look at them. And they thought to themselves, well, maybe that's the reason why there was so much violence going on in the 70s and 80s. Because you had all these kids growing up watching all this stuff on TV. And then people started to say, well, is the TV the problem? Is music the problem? It's the music they're listening to? But it's not, it, it's not all that. It's like going back to correlations. It's a correlation. There's a relationship, but one does not cause the other. Like I said, my daughters play that game. That they don't go to school the next day and start, you know, with the chainsaw and their and their cheerleading outfits start, you know, socks, you know, sawing up all their their fellow classmates. I mean, but like I said, we're a monkey see monkey do society, and we learn a lot of things by visually watching. I mean, I still laugh if if you any of you know anything about um, the show on MTV called Part of My jackass okay and when they used to show it it didn't used to have like for the first year or two that it was on tv it didn't have that little warning it did not have that warning say don't try this the people on the show or this this and that we don't and there wasn't that legal warning why do you think they started to put that up it was because kids at home were actually trying to <laughs> repeating and doing exactly what they saw on the show. And then someone got hurt, someone sued MTV, and now they have the legal warning. It is hilarious when you think about it, but we do learn by observation. Maybe not intentionally. We don't even realize we're picking up stuff. That's why I said, like, that's what I said, like, about do any of you have, like, things that do you talk with your hands like your mom or dad does? Um, do you um, ever ca catch phrases and stuff like that? That's like that's why it's like really important to have positive role models, and this is where the whole positive observational learning comes into play. Okay, um, when we talk about pro-social, positive models can have a good effect on observational learners. I mean, a case in point: um, people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Gandhi influenced Martin Luther King. Most people don't, and, and unless you really know history and know, that's where Martin Luther King got his nonviolence approach from. Gandhi was able to free his entire nation from the most powerful and peerless nation in the world, Europe at that time, by being non, by, through nonviolent protest. That same nonviolent protest that he used is going to be mimicked years later in the 1960s and 70s in, in um, the United States during the civil rights movement. So positive role modeling, role modeling does work, but you have to think about like um, um, the examples we set because we teach others. If your older brother or older sister, your younger siblings are learning watching you. 
And you might not think, well, that's not my responsibility, but I'll give you an example. Cause like I said, the parental example of actions and words are consistent. If you've ever had that parent that says, do as I say, not as I do, you know what I mean? Um, hypocrisy is, is a learned thing. I'm going to give you an example of something I did and I didn't realize until I was older and I was teaching this, but I did with my own kids and I actually taught them that om omission is not a lie. And I didn't even realize I taught them that through my actions. Um, when we were, when, when um, my girls were younger and little um, and we used to live in not this big of a house because we were one income family. Now we're two because I work. Um, I used to get them like little fast food, like, like happy star meals at Carl's Jr. and stuff like that. And my husband would get mad because he's like, um, you know, you know, don't, we don't have the money. You should just be making them sandwiches. And every once in a while I'd sneak them a superstar meal or a happy meal. Right. And then I turn around and I say, I say, look, I said, if daddy doesn't ask, you don't have to tell him. But if he asks, you tell him, tell him the truth. I never encourage them to lie, but I tell them, I basically through my actions taught him omission is not a lie. And that was, I mean, that hit me pretty hard when I realized it as I got older, what I had done. But I mean, that's what I mean by no one is perfect. And we learn by observing others and even your parents, no one's going to be perfect when it comes to this, but it's very important to have positive role models. And if you don't have one to be that for somebody else, because people learn by observation every day, the kids that are around you learn by seeing. If you've ever been around a little kid, barely speaking any, barely speaking, and you said the wrong word and they heard it come out of your mouth and then they start walking around and repeating a curse word. And you're like, and you, you think it's funny by laughing, what are you encouraging them to do? Say it over and over and over again. Did you mean for them to say it? No, but they heard it. They learned by observing. So going to our last slide, which thank you. Um, observational learning, violence in media. Um, you have all these mass shootings that are taking place right now. And I can go all the way back to the very first one that took place, which was Columbine. And I remember living through the um, newscasts and the reports and they would say, oh, was it the music they were listening to? Because they were listening to Marilyn Manson. Was it, you know, was it the game that they were playing because they were playing Doom video games? Um, was it the movie that they were watching over and over again because they were watching Natural Born Killers? What made these boys crack? Why did they go to school and shoot it up? And they're, they're, I mean, there's tons of people that kept, trying to blame everything on the violent um, medias that they were watching and seeing. But we all watch stuff like that. We don't go to school the next day and hello, we don't, it doesn't happen. I, uh, it's a correlation thing happening, but it's not cause and effect. There's a relationship, but I think there's something already wrong with the person, when the people that do that, there's something already wrong there. And we, everybody tries to blame things, tries to blame other things outside of it. But you really have to think and learn. I mean, I tell my students, I go, one day you're gonna be a parent. I mean, how old is too, is too young to watch certain cartoons? How, how old is too young to watch, um, PG-13, rated R movies. I mean, as, as you get old and you become a teenager, your mindset, you know that what they've learned now is the, the teenage mind has, doesn't even, your adult mind doesn't even form until you're about 24, 25 years old. So observational learning is a big thing that we all do. And it's not just our parents and the people we live with, but it's the things we see on TV or the games we play and, and all these things have an effect on our psyche, depending on what's already there. Um, correlation studies have been done. And like I said, if you know the difference between a correlation and an actual cause effect, which is experiment, correlation just shows a relationship. 
So I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean. Um, the more children watch violent media, the more at risk for aggression and teen crime. That's just a correlational fact that's out there. Um, homicide rates doubled during 1957 and 1974. And this coincided with household TV access. The more people had access to TV, the more the homicide rate went up. That's not a coincidence because guess what happened? When TVs got were accessible in Africa, they had the same spike. So it leaves us with a, a conundrum of what does this say about us and how can we change how can we change it? You know, um, there's no perfect answer. I could tell you, like I like I like I told my students, um, the the thing about observational learning is about positive role modeling, um, teaching people that just because you see something, it's a pretend box. It's not real. When you, you know, in a video game, I mean, think about the amount of video games you play, right? Does anybody play video games where you like blow people up and shoot people? I mean, you don't go and do something like that the next day. But, but like I'm saying, it's like the access, there's, there's a correlation. And it's important that we understand the difference between pretend and real and that we teach our kids that and we teach the difference in that. And that like, even when they talk about, but you know, you see shows and they, they show people that the violence that's done to people like law and order special victims unit, you know, they don't show the after effect of a crime. They don't show the after effect on the family. And maybe if more people saw that the less violence and stuff would be happening. Um, but that's just some food for thought for observational learning. Um, so really quickly in the learning chapter, we have three main theories. We have classical conditioning, which was created by Ivan Pavlov. It's the foundation of all other types of learning. There would be no operant conditioning. There will be no observational learning if it wasn't for classical. Okay. Remembering that classical conditioning involved the um, conditioned stimulus, the conditioned response, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, and the stimulus. Um, then you had operant conditioning, which Skinner took classical and put it up one more. And that's where we have reinforcements and punishments for behavior. Um, positive and negative reinforcement, the Skinner box, the difference between negative reinforcement and punishment, these are all things that are built on. Um, going back to classical conditioning, when we talk about shaping behavior, um, if I remember shaping, extinction, acquisition, and then I, and I'm trying to remember the one where it comes back. I can't remember the words. But these are all things that connect one from another. And then we have observational learning with Albert Bandura, which is the easiest one of them all. I mean, to be honest, monkey see, monkey do. If, that, if you learn anything, that's what observational learning is. When you hear Bubble the Clown, you should automatically think Albert Bandura. Um, does anybody have any questions, concerns? Yeah, yeah. Let's see if anybody answered the poll. Ooh, there were no votes. I got to get more, more, more of you talking. You guys don't like to talk at all, or it's just a Sunday, and we're all too dang tired to think. I always think, like, it's funny. When my kids come into class on Monday, I always think like that, too. They're, like, half asleep, and I'm like, you guys, the weekend's over. The week has started. Um, I hope um, this helped any of you with any questions you have about observational learning. Um, does anybody have any questions or not understand the difference between observational learning, classical conditioning, and op operant conditioning while I'm here because I can help. Anybody? There's four of you here, so at least somebody's here. I'm like, hello. Um, T Zizzle. Three. Um, if not, I hope you guys all have a fabulous weekend. Um, I will tell you this. I do have my students do like to – to bring this, because remember, I, I know for those of you that are returning, um, I do have this little activity I do with my students. I make them do like a, their own little version of a commercial of what type of learning they think is best. Um, that way it's easier to remember. Um, 
<laughs> they're they're actually really cute. They've done some. Most of them do classical because because to them that's the easiest one to do. My favorite ones have been observational though because they're really easy to demonstrate and um, operate, which all of you should know because that's what your teachers used on you when you were in elementary school. Shh. Remember the color cards or the gold stars and your hand in the treasure chest, positive negative reinforcement. So uh, remember at Think Fiveable on social media with Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, I hope everybody had a good time and I taught you some things. None of you seem to have any questions. I wish we could have a conversation. It would be cool. Um, I hope all of you have a happy Thanksgiving and um, I'll be doing the review. So I'll see you all for the review right before finals. Um, I hope I'll see you soon and have a happy Thanksgiving.